thank you everyone for attending this general meeting of the UBC Emeritus College. Uh, we begin as usual with uh, a business meeting, which will take about 15 minutes, and then we will move on to the main substance of the meeting, which is a panel involving Richard Price and Alan Sens talking about prospects for international politics after Trump. Uh, as we begin, I would like to take the time to acknowledge that UBC's Vancouver Point Grey campus is situated on the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Musqueam people. And I would also like to acknowledge that many of you today are joining us from places near and far, and we acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands as well. I should also note for your information that this event is being recorded for archival purposes. Uh, the recording will be posted on the website of the Emeritus College, and you will receive a link uh, to that posting after it is up on the web. So thank you. Uh, I'm delighted to have my old friend and colleague, Ken Carty, uh, chairing the panel today. Uh, and, and as well, of course, Richard Price and Alan Sens from Political Science uh, delivering the substance of that panel on an issue that is of really continuing and uh, widespread importance, the fate of international politics in the post-Trump era. But before we get to that, and as usual uh, in these general meetings, we have a little time set aside for uh, an update on the business affairs of the college. So as we move into that, I would like to welcome everyone and say that I hope you and yours are continuing safe through this long winter of virtual incarceration, but take part from the fact that the days are getting longer, the sun seems to shine occasionally and more than occasionally, and I hope that we will soon be into both the warmer times and more optimistic circumstances with respect to vaccinations and the opportunity to get out and about. Uh, it would be very nice to be able to meet in person at these uh, general meetings and at other occasions, but I'm afraid that that is not all that likely to transpire in the immediate future. So we will have to be content with seeing each other on the screen in very large part. Uh, I may go down as the first and I hope only principal of the Emeritus College, never actually to see any of the members of the college in person through an entire year. But so be it. Uh, I think we have had an interesting and uh, productive time in adapting to the circumstances forced on us just about a year ago. So if we could have the slide now, Sandra, I'd just like to open up the discussion here today by reporting for, <clears throat> for all of those, excuse me, <clears throat> for all of those in the general meeting on the major work that the council has undertaken uh, through the last several months. The diagram that you see on the screen in front of you is really both a representation and an organizational template for what we are thinking of as the new structure for the Emeritus College. Uh, this is in some senses more evolutionary than revolutionary. I won't describe it as merely a moving around of deck chairs because that conjures up unfortunate images of the Titanic but those of you who know the work of the Association of Professors Emeriti from which the Emeritus College emerged uh, and who know the work of the Emeritus College in the last few years will find many elements of this diagram to be quite familiar. Uh, the new parts of it are the ways in which these different elements are organized and combined. And I just wanted to say a few words about that so that the understanding of this new structure is disseminated among the membership as widely as possible. 
uh, you'll see at the center of this diagram, a yellow triangle, which represents the executive, the principal, the vice principal and the past principal. And then surrounding them uh, in that triangle, the yellow, uh, sorry, the blue circle of the council, nine members elected at large. And uh, beyond the, the council, you will see that there are a number of oval shapes uh, hung off that central diagram, which represent various clusters of activity. And this in some way is a clearer representation of activities that used to be conducted for the most part uh, without the organizational structure that is implicit in this diagram. At the bottom, you will see the Retirement Matters Cluster. And this is the cluster that does a huge amount of the really important good work that the college does in service of emeriti, both prospective and current. Uh, we have worked very hard uh, through the good offices of some of our council members and others on easing the transition to retirement, uh, providing people approaching retirement, but still active on faculty with information. Uh, we have a membership committee that among other things considers applications for membership in the college by people who are not automatically enti entitled by the UBC Senate by virtue of their period of service uh, at UBC and their age. And the benefits committee has done hugely important work in the past and continues to do that in monitoring and making arrangements for a variety of extended health and travel benefit arrangements. Uh, be beneath that line, you can see that we have various other committees that are active in a variety of ways. There's been some retooling there so that the continuing scholarly activity and engagement committee is now constituted essentially as something of a, a think tank, uh, a group of colleagues committed to the college who will gather periodically to brainstorm about initiatives and to endeavor to develop ways of implementing them. Uh, the college has been fortunate in having uh, a sum of money allocated by President Ono to provide some support, some subsidy support for scholarly expenses incurred by Emeriti. And we now have a new committee charged with uh, dispensing those monies and they will be rewriting and publicizing the terms of eligibility and the processes for application for those reimbursements or subsidies. And then finally, an awards committee because the Emeritus College has a couple of high profile awards uh, about which you will hear at the annual general meeting uh, later this year. Uh, one of these president's award, another created this year by the college. So these are some of the things that we have been doing and intend to sharpen up our activity in for our membership. The other two ovals uh, really represent uh, less formal activities and com commitments. The activities cluster is uh, an umbrella for special interest groups. And we have a number of those that many of you are aware of. Uh, photography, travel, uh, poetic uh, interests, uh, and, and film, and so on. But there certainly is room for innovation and the creation of new groups. There's no limit on the size of people, the number of people enrolled, uh, or indeed only limits in the imagination to the kinds of activities that might be undertaken, whether it's music appreciation or book groups or hiking or cycling uh, or whatever. So there is room uh, and we hope to encourage wider participation in the affairs of the Emeritus College through encouraging any among you to generate ideas for special interest groups. And if you do have a notion you'd like to pursue, please feel free to contact me or Sandra Van Ark in the office and we can help you uh, with any sort of prerequisite knowledge that you might require. 
Finally, the programs cluster is really the group that delivers all of the public events that you may be aware of or that I hope you will become aware of as time goes by and we ramp up our, our publicity and delivery efforts. The Senior Scholars Series, the uh, general meetings uh, at which you're now in attendance for one uh, and a variety of other activities. Uh, these are open to very wide audiences and we are very keen for suggestions and ideas, both about speakers and topics uh, and uh, would love to hear from you on those points. All of these things, the programs, the activities and the retirement matters represent a good deal of effort on the part of separate committees. And one of the messages I want to try and get across today is that really the Emeritus College is a volunteer driven organization and it's the support of the membership that will allow us to flourish and thrive and continue to provide the sorts of support that we aspire to offer. So these uh, elements are really quite crucial to what we do. And you will have noticed on the diagram that we also have a communications uh, component. And there is room there for those who are interested in various kinds of dissemination of information uh, and communication and editorial activities to also find a niche. But my fundamental message is that uh, I hope that we can expand our base of involved colleagues and emeriti and that we can broaden out the benefits that accrue to the group as a whole from the endeavors of, of a committed and energetic group of volunteers such as have carried the college to where it is now. There are great prospects for growth and improvement and I think we now have a structure in place that will allow that to take place very smoothly. Uh, finally, let me conclude by saying that uh, as part of our communications effort, we do have a newsletter which is circulated to all emeriti. Uh, Marjorie Fee is the wonderful editor of that newsletter and she is open to uh, this, this, the submission of material for the next newsletter. The deadline for that is this Friday. So if you want to report publications, awards, achievements, or interesting activities, please send that material either to Sandra Van Ark or directly to Marjorie. Thank you. Uh, that's pretty much it for the business side of this meeting. So I'm going to now hand things over to Ken Carty, an emeritus colleague from political science who will set up our panel discussion and introduce the panelists. Thank you. Thanks very much, Graham. I hope people are able to hear me. It turns out that someone uh, in the apartment above us has started renovating with a jackhammer this morning. And so uh, I had to move down into a common room and our building not out of any kind of lack of interest or boredom. Uh, it's because I'm in a weird situation. In fact, it just now said on my screen, my internet is uh, unstable. Um, but we're gonna talk about world politics today uh, because part, in some part, uh, because the last four years have seen the norms of international politics disrupted by the recent administration of President Trump. But now he's gone or at least he's vacated the White House. And many of people are asking what the future shape of world politics is gonna look like. Are we gonna have a return to the status quo ante? Are we gonna have more of the same kind of disruption and uncertainty? Or is there gonna be an emergence of a very new set of dynamics governing world politics and international relations? And whatever the answer to that, whichever of those options seems most likely, we're naturally concerned about what Canada's role in that whole process is gonna be and how Canada-US relations are going to fit into uh, this changing world. So today we're very fortunate to have very 
distinguished colleagues from the political science department, both Killam Prize winners, I should uh, note, to help us think about these issues. Richard Price is a professor and head of the Department of Political Science, and many of you will know he is a former senior advisor to UBC President Chief. He's a world leading scholar of normative international relations theory, the politics of international law, and ethics of politics. Um, I can tell you that he has a book about to appear from Cambridge University Press entitled Moral Psychology, Neuroscience, and International Norms. And I think everyone will want to put that on their shopping list for next Christmas. Uh, Alan Sins is a professor of teaching and he's the former head of the Interdisciplinary International Relations Program in the Faculty of Arts, one of the largest undergraduate majors in the faculty. He's also one of the pioneers of a very successful joint uh, course on global issues open to both arts and science students and attempt to bring them together and bring their perspectives together, thinking about some of these things. His research interests include big questions of international security, conflict, conflict management, the United Nations, and Canadian foreign policy. Each of them has agreed to talk for about 15 minutes, after which we're gonna open the chat function to questions and uh, pick their brains. Uh, Richard's gonna start with big concerns for a liberal rules-based international order and the impact of globalization. And then Alan's gonna follow up by turning our attention to alliance politics, nuclear weapons, and to help us try and locate Canada's role in this changing world. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Richard Price. Welcome, well, thanks Richard. very much, Ken. And uh, thank everybody for being here. It's a real pleasure to be invited to this uh, super distinguished group. Um, this is Ken was suggesting, when we want to think about, you know, what is international politics going to look like in the future? I think we want to get some sense of, well, how are we characterizing, you know, where we've been and, and what it looks like? And two major themes that uh, international relations scholars and practitioners alike have really been hotly debating in recent years have been, as Ken mentioned, uh, the prospects of the so-called liberal international order or rules-based international order. Uh, that's been at the top of many people's uh, minds and as well the future of what people put in this huge basket of globalization. So I thought I'd speak to both of those uh, elements and to do so um, I just want to step back a bit and say you know if we're talking about you know the international uh, scene and global order what is it that you know a global order does and for me there's several key things. One is a global order tries to make uh, global politics safe for its key political actors. And we're in, a, we're in a world, for better or for worse, of sovereign states with their governments, right? That's the dominant political form we have today. Uh, international orders also try and make uh, things safe and good for business and prosperity, right? Economic activity. Um, and then they also try and do some other things that have been the things I think that have been most contested in recent years. That is not just focus on states, but perhaps focus on people, right? So I'm gonna to speak to each of those and, and try and think through what's changing, what's different, what did Trump and others disrupt um, and what might be more resilient. So if we look at the fundamental purpose of the international order, it's currently to make sure that it's safe for its primary political actors, that is states, countries and their governments. Uh, and that primarily means contain the threat of major warfare. Um, I don't see a major change in that. And in fact, the long-term uh, trajectory is pretty convincing in terms of research that the world has become a better place overall uh, in terms of the frequency of wars, but the casualties, because we don't see large scale uh, wars between great powers, uh, World War I, World War II. That's not to discount the awful uh, casualties that have occurred in wars that we have seen in Syria and, and erupting elsewhere. But, you know, statistically, they're just of a much smaller nature. So against the, you know, the doomsayers who say, oh, if the coming war of China and the US, uh, I don't see that. Alan Sands might have a different view, what we'll hear. Um, this fundamental part of the international order uh, is not changing. In fact, it's been getting better over the So, you know, the bottom line, are we headed to World War III because of, you know, the breakdown of the old order? No. Uh, COVID-19 is today's World War III. 
And tomorrow's World War IV is climate crisis. Um, but those are very real threats. Uh, they're large, large scale, uh, but they're different kinds of threats. Now, an international order also has to make the world safe for states and the governments, not just from guns and bombs and external depredation, but internally and in their legitimacy. And here, I think there are some real challenges afoot. And Trump really has been uh, somebody who's disrupted things to a remarkable degree. And this is talking about the legitimacy and authority of governments around the world. Many are under severe challenge or even crisis. There's populist movements on the right and on the left. There's the failures to deal with the climate crisis, challenge to you know, the monopoly on state violence, which is a characteristic of, of states and governments. The Black Lives Movement, for example, challenging uh, that. Uh, indigenous challenges to territorial sovereignty. So there's many challenges to the authority of the nation state in today's world. Um, I can speak to uh, any you might be interested in potentially. For me, most worrisome is the global decline in liberal democratic institutions. Uh, for the first time since 2001, there are now more autocracies than democracies in the world, about 54% to 49, depending on how you count them. Uh, we're down from a peak probably around 2010 of about 98 states that were democratic. We now, again, depending on how you count, have probably something like 87, uh, which is home to about 46% of the world's population. So there's a clear, some have called a democratic recession uh, that we've been uh, witnessing. <clears throat> um, you know, 2019 was a loss of eight democracies. That's a new record at the rate of democratic breakdowns. Uh, first time the EU has a country that many experts no longer classify as a democracy in Hungary. India is on the verge of losing its status as a democracy. And of course, in the US, uh, the Trumpist rejection of the presidential vote and the shocking assault on the Capitol mark a severe democratic decline. Uh, I don't see that uh, the uh, GOP embrace of authoritarianism in the US is particularly temporary and an anomaly, given that the majority of the GOP has just accepted the use of violence to overturn an election they lost uh, with their vote in the impeachment process. And the key causes of that extremism, which I'd be happy to speak to, uh, are still there, among them gerrymandering and, and things like that. Now, at the same time, I like to try and find a bit of uh, cause for uh, optimism. Um, and mass mobilization protests are actually at an all-time high. Um, in 2019, the share of countries with pro-democracy mass protests went up to 44%. That was from 27% a decade before. Um, citizens in 29 democracies mobilized against autocratization uh, around the world. Mass protests in 34 autocracies, and some of which were very successful. Uh, leaders removed in the Sudan and Algeria, long-standing authoritarian leaders. Um, so uh, Joe Biden, as the new president of the United States, recognizes uh, the importance of this threat to democracy for the international scene and what the international institutions will look like. And he's proposed a summit of democracies. Um, so it remains to be seen uh, what happens. But clearly, he's trying to reverse uh, the types of things that uh, Trump has done. Um, it's going to be a tough battle, given that he does not have a long time to work in the US with the fate of uh, the House of Representatives and the Senate within just a two year window, uh, highly uncertain. Now what's driving all this stuff? I wanna to point to, to three things I think that are behind all this. One is a widespread decrease in the acceptance of state authority. And I think that's related to a widespread distrust in elites and authority more generally. That's been sparked by a number of things, but things like the 2008 economic crisis, financial crisis, I think was really critical in the West. Um, it's also been fueled by what some have called anti-social media instead of social media um, and the toxic kinds of uh, propaganda and lies that it's spread often to the advantage of authoritarian types of leaders. And three has been uh, the persistence and indeed growing depending on how you calculate it inequality in the world. Globalization is a funny thing because the economic processes have made the world a much wealthier place. The poorest of the world are not nearly as poor as they used to be overall. 
but the gap between rich and poor, again, depending on how you count it, has grown. And there's certainly a political perception that many people feel like they have not benefited by globalization. That's what's really important. Trump was a product and symptom of these kinds of forces, a suspicion of authority and, and the reigning uh, institutions. And then as the political arsonist of our time, all the norms that go along with that for democracy and otherwise, uh, he really put fuel on all of that. Will the pandemic be another kind of threshold event similar to things like the financial crisis of 2008? One of the interesting things about big changes in global order is that you typically see them after the big events that Alan is well familiar with, he may speak to, which is wars, and particularly global wars. That's when you see major reorderings. So after World War I, there was an attempted World War II, we have our UN system and the whole economic system set up. What follows from my view that we're not likely to have another world war is that we don't have the big shocks to the system that provide for those kinds of major reorganizations. Will a pandemic play such a role? Is that a big enough shock? It's hard to say. I think it will uh, generate some changes, but as, as Alan can attest, IR scholars, scholars of international relations and practitioners have been warning about a pandemic for years and indeed decades. <laughs> Not enough was done. So will the fact that we've actually had one now rather than a hypothetical one to plan for mean that states will take it uh, a lot more seriously. Well, I mean, the United States is gonna engage back with the World Health Organization rather than Trump's withdrawal from it, including funding for it. The WHO is never going to be uh, a panacea for all these, uh, but it could have uh, an important uh, impact in, um, I, I think, generating something of a backlash against the backlash. That is, the Bolsonaro's and Trump's of the world were kind of a backlash against the establishment and against authority and, and so on. And with the coronavirus and the vaccinations, that may give governments you know, the ability to actually uh, deliver uh, and give a bit of a boost and a booster shot to the casualties of populism, truth, facts, experts, science, nature, <laughs> disease, which ignores uh, political lies. So uh, we'll see, but I suspect there will be uh, a bit of reaction in the other direction uh, that, that Trump was taking us down. Um, the other thing that we have global orders for is not just take care of the political actors we have as states, but uh, fundamentally that system has always existed in uneasy tension with what I call a cosmopolitan project. That is taking care of individual people. And the easiest way to understand that is just human rights, right? The global movement for human rights. It's embedded in the UN system. We have countless treaties on all kinds of things prohibiting you know, torture and uh, for uh, equality of women and just uh, so many different ones. That too is something that Trump uh, sought to uh, take a wrecking ball to um, in really important ways. And, um, this is what a lot of people have in mind when they say, what's the future of the liberal international order? And I've never liked that term because the order has never been fully liberal. There's been liberal elements to it, like human rights um, and economic uh, liberalism, like free trade, or open finance. But we've never had a fully liberal system. But we've had lots of liberal multilateral norms and institutions. In the heyday of that was really the post-Cold War period in the 1990s. That's when the World Trade Organization, the WTO, was created. Uh, international criminal tribunals uh, for Rwanda and Yugoslavia, which became the International Criminal Court. Uh, all kinds of other treaties on chemical weapons and landmines and so on. Um, so that was a big you know, building period. Um, and Trump has tried to take a hammer to a lot of those. Uh, but he's hardly the only one. And I think we are in a period of retrenchment because a lot of the key actors in this form of order aren't so much states and their governments, it's civil society and NGOs and international organizations and institutions. And we've seen many countries from Russia to Turkey to India to Saudi Arabia really contract the ability of citizens and civil society members to organize transnationally. They've engaged in a bunch of uh, measures to shut that down. So I think we've seen uh, a reduction of that kind of liberal uh, uh, world order uh, activity. 
Um, and a good way to think about this is borders have become less porous. Countries have enacted all kinds of measures to try and uh, keep that kind of activity out. And I think the pandemic's gonna make that worse. Uh, we've seen this unprecedented closing of the borders and refugees and migrants have kind of fallen off everybody's radar screen with the pandemic, but that was one of the big crises people were trying to wrap their heads around. And we've seen how states can quickly put up their borders and enact incredible restrictions that go totally against the grain of globalization. So I think we're clearly in a period of, of retrenchment. Um, what other norms has Trump in this regard try, tried to take on and, and others like him? Um, I'm happy to speak to them in, in a question period. Um, Alan, I think will speak about nuclear weapons and the military side of NATO. Um, I'll mention just two in passing that were pretty fascinating that Trump didn't take on. Uh, you may recall in his uh, campaign, he spoke explicitly about uh, torture and that he didn't think you know, the ban on torture was a good thing. And if he got into office, boy, he'd do a lot, a lot worse than waterboarding. Well, he didn't go there. Uh, the former head of the CIA might have been a reason. He famously said, well, if you're going to do that, bring your own bucket, because none of us are going to do it for you because we'll be legally liable. Um, so there's been institutional constraints on Trump's ability to go there. Uh, another one was on one of the weapons of mass destruction. I think Alan will speak about nuclear weapons. Uh, that is chemical weapons. Of all people, when Syria used chemical weapons, twice it was President Trump who responded with military attacks against Syria to get them to stop using this weapon of mass destruction. Trump, Obama didn't do that. Um, it was Trump reinforcing that global norm. Um, really quite extraordinary. Um, but the main point being that we didn't see, despite all going on in the world, a major erosion of taboo against a key weapon of mass destruction. Okay, and that's important to keep in mind. Uh, third thing um, that global orders typically try and do is to make things good for business and for economic activity and prosperity. This has always been a very tilted playing field. Uh, different uh, regions of the world benefit much more than others in any given economic system that we've had. Um, and it's pretty clear that we've seen a retrenchment from the kind of universal large scale uh, international economic treaties expansion of globalization that is opening up finance to open financial flows and so on. And there's been a sharp reaction to all those things which go under the label of globalization. But what does that mean? Does that mean the rejection of multilateral you know, institutions and agreements? I'd say no. What it means is a rejection of the universal multilateral ones like the uh, World Trade Organization but instead we're seeing a pivot to what some call minilateral or regional agreements. So we see a kind of rejigged, you know, uh, trans-Pacific partnership without the US. Uh, just last fall in 2020, we see a new East Asian Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Sorry for that mouthful. <laughs> There's 10 countries of Asia, uh, the ASEAN group, China, Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, biggest trading group in the world economy. We also see a new African continental free trade area. So we're not seeing the end of, of you know, mini globalization in more regional variants. Uh, indeed, countries still wanna have uh, free trade agreements. So that's the kind of dynamic I see uh, going forward. Uh, the result is then uh, what I expect is we will see an era of thinner, narrower and less institutionalized uh, multilateral institutions. So rather than new global treaties and strong organizations, more characteristic will you'll see things like declarations, uh, compacts like in migration, uh, agreements with voluntary commitments, the Paris Climate Accord, it's not a hard treaty with fast legal commitments. Uh, we'll see codes of conduct, ad hoc coalitions of the willing, those kinds of things. Um, as uh, countries kind of retreat a bit into a more sovereigntist uh, mode. Um, I'll leave it there. I could also speak to a final factor, which I think is driving a lot of this, which is the digital, digital economy. Um, that is one area that has been seeing increased globalization that has flows across borders. And yet I think we're gonna see a really sharp reaction to that. There's a lot of legislation pending in uh, the UK and the US now with the likes of 
uh, Elizabeth Warren and AOC holding some levers of power, uh, they're going to take aim at the social media giants. Um, and this is happening in the EU as well. Uh, so I think we're going to see uh, some reactions to that. But again, what it means is we're going to see the kind of uh, cyber or digital sovereignty rather than global open globalization as countries erect borders around the flow of information. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Alan. Thanks, Richard. Uh, Alan. Great. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you, everyone, for coming today. It's a delight uh, to be able to speak uh, to all of you. And I have to say, you know, I've been teaching for a very long time. This is more than 27 years now at UBC. And it's a great pleasure um, speaking to people who don't think that the 1990s was ancient history. So in many ways, it's a privilege because you can say so much more uh, than you might have been able to otherwise. I'm going to build a little bit about uh, on what Richard has said, mainly looking at alliances and uh, nuclear weapons and arms control. And then I'll talk a little bit about Canada, because I think we do need to talk about Canada. Uh, we can't describe Canada as a pressing global international security concern. <laughs> That's not what I mean. But we are very much uh, at the center of a great deal of the tumult that is going on in the world right now. So I think we do need to speak a little bit to it. Uh, let me go to alliances first. I, I think stepping back a little bit, uh, reminding ourselves about what the role uh, of US-led alliances were uh, in the world during the Cold War is very much part of the order that Richard described. I scratched out the word liberal that I had in my notes because I think he's quite right that uh, we can't describe this as an entirely liberal order. And the alliance system that the United States built um, is a reflection of that. It was built in tandem with this economic order, with this institutional order. And the two had an overlapping shared objective, which is to say to contain the Soviet Union during the Cold War. And to that end, uh, the United States led a coalition in Korea, fought the Korean War and left troops behind that are still there to this very day, the US-Korea Alliance. The United States built, created NATO in 1949. And during the Cold War, stationed between 250 to 300,000 US personnel on that continent, right up until the end of the Cold War. The United States joined with its closest ally, Canada, in the creation of the North American Air Defense Agreement in 1957. In 1960, signed the US-Japan Security Treaty, where there are still about 50,000 US personnel in and around the Japanese islands, supporting that treaty with Japan. And this, this network of treaties then was intended to operate in tandem with the development of this international order, not only to secure uh, the so-called free world against the threat of communism, the Soviet Union, um, but that was clearly a, a major objective. Um, these alliances had broad support in the United States. They were broadly supported in the American public, they were broadly supported in Congress, and they were broadly supported in both the Democratic and Republican parties. Now, when the Cold War ended, there was an erosion of this support. It wasn't huge, but it was there. And that's largely because the, the Soviet Union collapsed and the threat against which so many of these alliances were directed fell away. And although NATO in particular was, be, was able to reinstate or reestablish a purpose, which I'll speak to in a moment, uh, it was nevertheless the case that there was some decline in that period. There was also repeated arguments from repeated US administrations, whether they be Democratic or Republican, that European allies and America's allies more generally around the world had to do more. They had to share the burden to a much greater extent in the post-Cold War world, both in terms of money, defense spending, and in terms of providing troops to multilateral military operations, be they in the Balkans or in Afghanistan or in Somalia, to take three well-known examples. And then along comes Trump. And Trump is the first nominee of a party and the first president to openly question the value of the US alliance system. He made repeated 
public and especially private statements to this effect during his period in office. He questioned the value of NATO to his advisors. He expressed repeatedly a desire to withdraw the United States from NATO. He repeatedly made derogatory and quite undiplomatic statements about America's European allies for not spending enough on defense. And at one time famously questioned the integrity of Article 5 of the NATO Treaty, which is the article in the treaty that binds all members to come to the common defense if attacked. It's the cornerstone of the treaty. And this is significant because if there is one key characteristic to the post-World War II order, it has been America's commitment to the institutions, the structures, and the alliances that it itself had built. And Richard's already spoken to how Donald Trump in many ways has taken a wrecking ball to that structure, or at least crucial elements of it. And it seemed to be the same with NATO. It was the same abroad. He questioned the United States commitment to South Korea, demanding the Koreans pay more. He questioned the United States commitment to Japan. He wanted the Japanese to pay more. And on it went. And part of this is, is Trump's very transactional approach to international relations. Uh, he, his prevailing view was that these were all bad deals that America had signed. They were enabling America's allies to rip America off. And as a result, he was going to renegotiate or terminate these alliances. Is he going to have a lasting impact? What are the prospects going forward? I think there's a couple of, of pieces of good news, but there's one piece of not so good news in this respect. The first piece of good news is the public, the US public actually remains broadly supportive of international engagement, uh, sorry, US engagement internationally in the world. A recent uh, Chicago Center uh, poll found that a, well, roughly a third of Americans for a very long time have been essentially isolationists. But in 2018, the number of Americans in that poll who supported active US engagement abroad was 70%. That's a pretty strong mandate. The second uh, big piece is that we now have the Biden administration coming into office and has made already repeated statements. And my understanding is through back channels uh, through NATO, um, repeated assurances that America is back in terms of being a uh, leader once again in the North Atlantic Treaty Organization and is supportive of both its commitments to the alliance and to the common defense. The wild card is the future of the Republican Party. Because if you recall, there were three cornerstones to the American uh, domestic US support for America's alliance system, public, Congress, and the two political parties. Uh, we don't really have that now because it depends enormously on the future of the Republican Party. If the Republican Party continues to go in the direction it is currently going, which is to say, to essentially leave behind most of the core elements and principles of what that modern party represents in United States politics, and instead becomes the party of Trump, then it is very possible that one of two, of two America's main political parties will now be actively as a matter of policy, as a matter of platform, anti-alliance, and more broadly speaking, anti-multilateral, anti-institutional. And that could be a sea change in American domestic politics, especially as Richard has mentioned, we could see control of various parts of the US government kind of flow back and forth over the electoral cycle. All right, how about, uh, how about nuclear weapons? Um, I'm smiling because uh, the, Trump has always had a very interesting relationship with nuclear weapons. And it goes back to well before he was a, a nominee, a candidate, and uh, before, of course, he became uh, president. As candidate, um, Trump was known for, on numerous occasions, asking his foreign policy advisors, why couldn't the United States use nuclear weapons? He genuinely does not, not seem to have understood the rationale for not using nuclear weapons. And in an interview 
Um, he was asked whether uh, there was a time when nuclear weapons could be used. And his response was possibly, possibly. And if he had followed it up with the standard caveat, which would be something along the lines of for deterrence or only if we are attacked or something along those lines, he probably could have gotten away with it, but he didn't. It stopped with period after possibly. When he came to power, uh, Trump uh, stated that he wanted to greatly strengthen and expand uh, the US nuclear arsenal to quote, outmatch any adversaries, close quote. He was also very skeptical of arms control agreements uh, more generally, which I'll expand on in just a moment. And then in one horrifying moment, he speculated about using nuclear weapons to prevent hurricanes from hitting the United States, which is an old Eisenhower era strategy that has been, shall we say, thoroughly scientifically discredited for the last 40 years. Uh, and yet there it was again, uh, with apparently his advisors just absolutely stunned and aghast uh, uh, with this. And then naturally, and perhaps, perhaps more worryingly, uh, he made his now infamous fire and fury comments with respect to North Korea. When Trump comes to office, he accelerated the rate of US spending on nuclear weapons, which had gone up during the Obama administration. It's something that's forgotten, but the Obama administration was increasing US military spending on nuclear weapons for the years of, of the Obama era. But when Trump comes to power 2017, um, uh, uh, his first year in office, uh, the um, US nuclear stockpile budgets, so that's the money that goes to uh, developing new US nuclear weapons and maintaining the ones they had, jumped by 50% between 2017 and 2021. When you look at the overall spending of the United States government, the budget request of Trump's last budget for Congress, that spending, requ spending request is about $46 billion, a significant increase over the Obama years. But he made his biggest uh, impact in the area of arms control um, by, in effect, taking a wrecking ball to some of the key arms control agreements that have been established uh, not only bilaterally with the Soviet Union, now Russia, uh, but then of course also uh, with uh, Iran. And so the Iran deal, which all US intelligence agencies and the International Atomic Energy Agency had both uh, uh, claimed that Iran was following the deal, was abiding by the deal, the deal was working. Trump came into power actively hostile to that arrangement to that um, uh, uh, treaty uh, arrangement and uh, repeatedly said that it was a bad deal and that he would do better. And he withdrew the United States from uh, the joint combined plan of action as it's technically called in 2018. Uh, Biden, uh, the Biden administration has signaled it's willing to return. Um, and it looks like there will be some movement on that uh, shortly. Uh, but that was a real blow to the international nuclear arms control regime. It's part of a larger pattern. Uh, Trump pulled the United States of the Intermediate Nuclear Force Treaty, a treaty that had been in place since 1987, covering uh, the deployment of nuclear weapons in, in, in Europe. He took the United States out of the Open Skies Treaty, which was the, one of the foundational treaties for international verification of nuclear arms control agreements. It enables uh, countries to overfly with permission to overfly um, uh, other countries' territories to verify that nuclear arms control agreements are in fact being adhered to. He pulled the United States out of that arrangement. Uh, and he delayed on New START, which is now the New START agreement just recently renewed by the Biden administration um, with the Putin government in Russia. That treaty, New START, is the last bilateral nuclear weapons treaty that exists between the United States and Russia. The two countries that together combine to hold 90% of the world's nuclear weapons. That's it. All the others are gone now, abrogated in various ways or forms, uh, two of the most recent um, by Trump. Uh, permanent damage 
has been done to the nuclear arms control regime. Uh, you, you won't find too many people that follow nuclear weapons that won't acknowledge that. The reason for that is treaties, once they're broken, they're really hard to reanimate. You've got to go back through a negotiation process. Usually countries find all sorts of reasons they didn't realize years ago for maybe they shouldn't have signed a treaty or they want new language in it. Negotiations drag on. And already the difficult challenge of trying to come up with new, new nuclear arms control arrangements um, has hit, uh, uh, I, I think, um, a snag from which it will not recover. Some of you may be thinking of the nuclear ban treaty. Uh, the nuclear ban treaty does not involve any of the nuclear powers in the world. So to this point, while it's laudable from a normative point of view, and I certainly um, support it for that reason, it has limited immediate utility because none of the current nuclear powers are signatories uh, to that uh, treaty. So I think we have on nuclear weapons, the second of our key international security concerns in the world uh, after the future of US leadership in the world, we have, we have lasting damage in this one area. Uh, which brings me to Canada. There's a couple points I wanna make about Canada just to uh, uh, conclude my remarks. And, and the first is, is that uh, the, the Trump administration put Canada in the most difficult position it has been in diplomatically, politically, and economically uh, since the end of World War II. Uh, and the, the, the biggest uh, picture impact was Trump's intentional undermining of the liberal institutional economic order. This order, this so-called liberal international order was fundamental to Canada's security and well-being. A country that cannot decisively determine its own security and well-being on its own, it has to do it in cooperation with others, requires an open trading system, requires a rules-based order in which Countries deal with each other based on norms and principles and legalities rather than brute strength, power, coercion, and reward. And Canada needed to have institutions and needed to have alliances, strong and healthy ones, so it could be a joiner, so it could be involved and engage with those alliances as an equal state along with the Americans in what we constantly refer to as our great counterweight strategy. Here we are right next door to the United States, the world's preeminent military, political, and economic power. And they're a lot like us culturally as well. So how do we exert our independence in the world? How do we forge our own identity in the world? Demonstrating our separateness from the United States. Well, in part, in foreign policy, you do it in tandem with others. And you do it by joining multilateral frameworks where you can sit as a symbolic equal with your American partners, but in which you have your allies and friends and partners around you to try to moderate American influence. Even as Trump took a wrecking ball to so many of those international institutions and orders, it was quickly recognized in Canada what this meant for us. Here on the North American continent with our economic dependence on the United States. That has been the single greatest concern that faced Canada during the Trump years. The shock quickly took active form in the imposition of aluminum and steel tariffs by the United States, by the Trump administration against Canada, and then of course the forced renegotiation of NAFTA with all of the possible threat that meant to Canada's economy a country which 70% of our exports go to the United States. What's going to happen after Trump? There's hope that the Biden administration will restore the American tradition of getting engaged in multilateralism. But there's a couple of other realities that I think cannot be easily erased, even if the Biden administration went wholeheartedly into the renewal of Americans' institutional and multilateral re-engagement around the world. The first is China. Uh, and the US-China relationship is going to be crucial for Canada 
and the future of that relationship now is in far more doubt. There's something to be said that the Trump administration recognized that something has to be done about China in terms of some of its policies around the world. There's no question about that. But there's overwhelming consensus in Washington right now, bipartisan consensus, one of the few areas of consensus that exists in Congress is that China is an emerging threat to the United States. And that means that Canada is going to be in a very awkward position with respect to our trade relationship with China, our political relationship with China, and what that is going to mean with our relationship with the United States. And the second area um, of concern for us going forward, and I'll end my comments with this last reflection, um, is that we do, when we do look to the future, I think it's very important that we recognize that a lot has shifted beneath our feet. Um, and one of the big shifts has been the, I think, largely permanent polarization within the United States. For a time, we could count on a general bipartisan consensus on core issues related to nuclear weapons, alliances, and Canada in the United States government. I don't think we can do that anymore. Because there now is in the famous echo chambers of the United States and the construct of a false alternate universe that so many Americans have found themselves wrapped up in. I think a permanent now view in the United States that these things are now all subject not only to interrogation, but in fact, perhaps uh, to a complete revision of American policy towards them. So I don't think we can be complacent. I don't think we can see Biden as a return to normal. I think there's a new normal and that new normal is much more unstable than it was in terms of America's place, role in the world and our relationship with it. I'll stop there. Thanks very much, Alan. Um, we're going to open the chat function now on Zoom and anyone who would like to uh, pose a question, uh, we'll try and uh, put them through and we'll try and get through as many as we can. Um, I might start by noting uh, to both of you that uh, Canada was recently defeated in a contest at the United Nations for a seat on the Security Council. Now, irrespective of what we think about the Security Council, we are defeated by Norway and Ireland. And one of the things that distinguishes them is that one of those countries contributes more to UN peacekeeping than Canada. Another one has a much better record of uh, development aid. And I'm wondering, is there some sense by uh, other countries out there that we're not pulling our weight in the world? Uh, even our friends and allies no longer think that we're, uh, we're, we're a significant uh, force uh, uh, in the international community. I don't know who might want to start with that. I can, I can start. Uh, I think there's a general view that there's sort of three primary reasons why Canada uh, did not get the Security Council seat. Uh, first of all, nobody should have been shocked. I mean, I really hope nobody was shocked because I, I think everyone in the Canadian government knew they weren't going to get the Security Council seat, at least those who had any serious knowledge of the environment. Uh, Canada hasn't been in the top 10 of contributors to United Nations peacekeeping since the uh, early 1990s. It's not, I think we're 50th on the list right now. Uh, we're not a serious player. Yes, we held the ministerial here in Vancouver. Um, yes, there was some renewed commitments, but it led to a very small reanimation of Canadian uh, commitments to the United Nations. The second area is foreign aid. Um, not a big player in foreign aid. Uh, our foreign aid budget has been dropping steadily. Um, it is well below OECD DAC standard, that is to say, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development Donor Assistance Committee. That is the committee of the OECD that manages the aid of most of the world's leading aid providers. Uh, and we are well under the uh, average of OECD countries in terms of both dollar commitments to foreign aid and percentage of GDP spent. And the final uh, element, I think, was our environmental record. And I think this is a bit of an enduring uh, feature from the Harper years. Um, the withdrawal from Paris, uh, excuse me, the withdrawal from Kyoto, a reluctance to engage meaningfully uh, with Paris. I just don't think there was enough time for the Trudeau government to reestablish 
of its bona fides uh, in that regard. So there are other smaller tactical reasons. We didn't play the game very well. Um, we did not do the kind of uh, schmoozing that is necessary to gain votes at the Security Council. We didn't provide enough of the short-term incentives for countries to give us their vote. Um, but Norway was, they're simply better. They're simply better, better contributor. Um, so you don't, I don't think we needed a clearer rebuke than this, but I don't think anyone should have been surprised either. Okay, we have, a, we have a couple of questions uh, beginning to appear that touch on a, a wide range of, uh, 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 of, of things. And one of them says that um, uh, in a recent top, uh, talk, Noam Chomsky said that if uh, Israel has argued that if the US reenters the treaty with Iran, Israel might be forced to bomb Iran. Um, is that likely? And what might the consequences of such a bombing be? I guess you're the bomb expert, Alan. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I had a colleague, a much loved colleague who's, who's passed. Many of you will, will know him, Mark Sacker. And for a year, Mark Sacker and I uh, were office partners. That is to say, his office was right next door to mine. And one day I arrived at the office to find two signs up on our respective doors. The sign on his door said butter, and the sign on my door said guns. <laughs> so I've always been associated with this guns and bombs person, but really I'm, I'm, I'm a conflict management guy, uh, first and foremost. But on the matter of Iran, um, this is a serious concern. The extent to which the Israeli government feels confident that the Joint Combined Plan of Action is leading to meaningful constraints or even the elimination of Iran's capacity to develop nuclear weapons is a key variable. And the reason for that, of course, is Israel is the country that would feel most threatened by an Iranian nuclear weapons capability and the ability to deliver it over um, the Middle Eastern region. Other countries would feel threatened as well, but Israel, first of all. And so a preemptive Israeli military attack has always been a nightmare scenario. It's been done before. Israel attacked the uh, Iraqi Osirak reactor in 1982, uh, and has recently also uh, attacked other targets in the Middle East, admittedly not always through the use of direct kinetic weaponry, uh, but the Stuxnet attack against Iran uh, with the National Security Agency of the United States and Israeli intelligence is a famous example of cyber warfare against Iran's nuclear arsenal. I, I believe that if the Biden government rejoins the JCPOA, that there's a very good prospect that Iran will return to full compliance, which is not currently compliant, um, but that they will return to full compliance. And if they do so, there will be enough evidence from US intelligence agencies and the International Atomic Energy Agency's inspections that will satisfy enough of the Israeli intelligence and analysis community that a, an actual strike will not be necessary. I hope I'm not being too optimistic, but that military option for Israel has always been open and they have the capacity to do it unilaterally. They don't need any help from anybody else to conduct that attack. I think the attack would be a huge mistake. I think it would be uh, extremely destabilizing, uh, but nevertheless, it remains a possibility. But I think we have to hope that it will be remote possibility uh, if the JCPO, JCPOA can be reanimated and is shown to be working to everyone's satisfaction. Thanks, thanks, Alan. I'm I'm freezing up a little bit here, but I think you've stopped uh, speaking. I can't quite tell. Uh, here's a question about uh, COVID-19. And uh, one of the uh, questioners says, there's an opportunity for being a good global citizen is it by improving production and access to the vaccine, uh, especially by low and middle income countries. And we wonder if there's any progress in this area being made with the new US, uh, US administration. Uh, I don't know if either of you have any sense of uh, uh, 
what progress they're making on that uh, on that front. And the, the Biden administration has at least said the right things. I mean, they've rejoined WHO. They're going to uh, put some two hundred million dollars back in. Um, there is a, a global uh, sort of compact, uh, but it hasn't delivered. Uh, it's short of funding. It hasn't been successful. Um, and the UN um, uh, Secretary General just made a call for the, we need a new global plan because it's failing because the vast majority of the world's nations still haven't received vaccinations. Um, you know, Trudeau as well has made um, statements of, of commitment along those regards to ensure that uh, vaccinations are provided to other countries. Uh, it would provide a, a real boost in terms of uh, the U.S. The question is more about the U.S., uh, the U.S. image around the world, because the U.S. image, uh, not surprisingly, is at its lowest uh, ever. And whenever polls you want to read, <laughs> the image of the United States is at uh, absolute rock bottom since, uh, you know, the Second World War. So, um, and, you know, those kinds of intangibles are, are hard to measure and what they deliver, but, but they do matter because one of the ways in which we were talking, the framing of this whole thing was really about what are the norms about how people do politics and what has changed and not. And one of the subtle ways that, that norms have an effect is that people just follow good models, right? Uh, they see somebody as that's the kind of, you know, person, country, what have you, that, that we want to be. Um, that's not the case with the United States uh, under Trump. And then it'd be, uh, and I've also seen data from political scientists that show that people do make meaningful differences. They don't just say the United States is the United States. They say the United States under Trump is a very different animal from the United States under on Obama and potentially a Biden. So people do make that discrimination. And I expect you'll see uh, some of these efforts um, will pay dividends, but Biden's concerns for me are gonna overwhelmingly be domestic. I mean, he has to take care of his domestic COVID problem, which is a complete disaster. I mean, they've lost more people by a huge measure, almost gonna be double soon, than they lost uh, combat casualties in World War II. I mean, the numbers are just staggering. So he's gonna be consumed in my view by uh, the internal, um, uh, dealing with uh, COVID and its economic implications and so on uh, before he'll uh, be able to launch, I think, any really meaningfully significant uh, international effort. There is a, a mix of questions about American relationships with Canada, particularly economic. Um, and they remind me, I've just finished reading the doorstopper uh, Obama memoir of his first term in office, over 700 pages, and Canada isn't mentioned once in seven, over 700 pages. It made me think maybe the Americans don't think much about it, but uh, one of our questioners reminds us that, you know, Trump did try and change the relationship through NAFTA, and the question is, have we come out of that all right? Uh, and now we're facing a Biden administration with a kind of commitment to buying American, which uh, raises questions for our trade balance. So where, where do we stand in this kind of shifting a set of uh, relationships that were disrupted, ignored by Obama, apparently disrupted by Trump, and now uh, perhaps moving in a different direction under Biden? Yeah, I, I think the it's a signal of a new period in the relationship. Uh, if, I mean, traditionally, democratic governments in the United States, democratic presidents, democratic House of Representatives, democratic senates, have actually been more of a worry to Canada on the, on the trade front. Because traditionally, the Democrats have been um, more attentive, shall we say, to the interests of domestic manufacturing, particularly connections to labor unions um, and to um, working class uh, manufacturing sector workers. So it was always a bit odd uh, because by values, more Canadians would probably align themselves with, with the Democratic Party in terms of positions on social issues, for example. Uh, with Republicans, as they, with their much more powerful free trade approach, 
um, were often periods in which there would be less trade tension. Uh, Trump completely turned that on his head. It's absolute 180. We've got the party of free trade in the United States is now the party of protectionism. Um, you know, some members of the Republican Party are now actively talking about working more closely with labor unions. Why? Because they represent blue collar workers that they believe will be important future Republican electoral coalitions. It's quite extraordinary. And so we're confronted in Canada now with the prospect of one of the few areas of bipartisanship that might exist in future US Congresses is gonna be an agreement on the prioritization of American jobs over America's trade relationship with its trading partners. And that's gonna include Canada. Now there's gonna be limits. There's going to be limits. Canada is the number one trading partner about 25% of US states. So that matters for the so-called, especially the border states of the US that will want to see that trade flow. Major supply chains in North America are intimately connected. Severing them is going to be expensive. And although Kuzma, the Canada-US-Mexico agreement, which replaces NAFTA, did do a little bit of severing with respect uh, to things like um, uh, domestic production content requirements and a variety of other measures, um, Nevertheless, Kuzma does look a lot like NAFTA in many important respects. So I, I think that we've got some security in the sense that US self-interest dictates a strong mutual trade relationship with Canada. But we cannot any longer, I think, rest on any set of assurances that that uh, uh, consensus is as strong in the United States as it used to be. Um, one might recall that both Hillary Clinton and, and Barack Obama made statements during their election campaign for the nomination of the Democratic Party that they would renegotiate NAFTA. All the while quietly telling Canadians under the table, don't, don't worry, don't worry, we're, we're just not going to do that. We're just saying it, but we're not going to do it. Don't worry about it. That, that's, we haven't been hearing that from the Biden administration. And we haven't been, certainly haven't been hearing it from any Republicans lately. So I, I, think, I think it's a, a bit of a new game. Um, and, and it's one that uh, Canadian governments are gonna be spending much more time now, I think, playing the game in Washington of trying to defend Canadian interests with respect to a whole host of economic issues. Uh, here's one uh, for both of you. Da David Edgerton writes, Compared to traditional forms of warfare, i.e. bombs, chemicals, landmines, new kinds of international conflict include hacking of power grids, telecommunication infrastructures, taking of high profile hostages. Uh, do you think that these are going to lead to a, a range of new high level international treaties of the kind that I guess uh, Richard re referred to uh, in the pre-Trump area? Yeah, really good question. There's, there's been lots of efforts to negotiate those, but they've failed. And, and during the Trump administration, not surprisingly, they were, uh, the US was, was missing in action. Um, and actually China and Russia <clears throat> were the ones who have been taking the lead at the UN. And for them, it's more about uh, you know, maintaining cyber sovereignty, as they call it, and national control over information flows and uh, internet controls, uh, banning Google and YouTube and what have you. So that's been a bit of a poison pill for uh, many Western countries. So that's been at a bit of a standstill. Uh, but David, you're absolutely right that in my view, uh, the kinds of threats that we see now uh, are things like cyber attacks. Most of those have been between, insofar as they've taken place between uh, really big powerful uh, countries have been more for information purposes. Uh, so Russia just again hacked um, uh, the United States uh, and China has a massive long record and the US of course we know from uh, the revelations uh, years ago now uh, has been spying on uh, everybody uh, with its own apparatus. So that's kind of business as usual. They've tended to keep it below a threshold. It's really kind of mutual deterrence of play of letting it get out of hand and really having incredibly disruptive uh, attacks. We've seen some of those disruptive attacks. Russia uh, 
uh, uh, alleged to have engaged in all kinds against Ukraine, uh, uh, for example. Um, but for the most part, there's been some, some tit for tats uh, with Iran, with North Korea uh, and the United States, but kept uh, kind of below threshold. So no, I don't see there, there being international treaties. I see there being just really a kind of practice of not going uh, overboard, particularly with uh, disruption. Uh, the second part of your question is really interesting on hostages. And that's where I see a lot of the um, kind of a, uh, uh, aggressions going on. Uh, it's not kind of big state to state warfare, it's targeting individuals. And you see that in all kinds of ways. Uh, one of the things you've seen are the rise of so-called Magnitsky style uh, sanctions. And this was an act passed in Congress and many countries, including Canada, have adopted similar acts to individually target uh, members of other countries' governments who they think were behind uh, things like, you know, the assassination of uh, people in, in those countries, often political opponents, you know, opposition figures and that. That's one thing we have seen. And I know international lawyers at our own um, Global Affairs Canada, a lot of them don't like these because this is, you're being judge and jury in your own case, right? You're not bringing something to an international court and getting errands. You're just saying, we're sanctioning these people because we think they committed an injustice. So there's actually a really vibrant debate even within foreign policy circles in Canada on these that uh, you want to punish people uh, for engaging in international atrocities such as targeted killings. And yet when you can't get global effort, there's nothing to be done. So there's been a resort to these measures uh, short of being able to get international treaties, which have just failed because the likes of China and Russia in particular uh, have been uh, quite skillful in ensuring that if there were any such discussions, they have on the table propositions that are non-starters for most uh, Western democracies. I'll just add a, a couple of points to, to what Richard has said. I think there's a, a couple of disturbing trends with respect to cyber war. And the first is that Richard's quite right that much of what we've seen has been uh, sort of measure, countermeasure, response, retaliation, a lot of espionage in the cyber world um, as well. And we've seen, of course, um, three patterns, governments hacking, others are using cyber war uh, techniques against others. Uh, cyber war techniques being used by proxies that we know are closely connected to a government, but are just arm's length enough to provide that government with uh, what I like to call implausible deniability in the sense that the government really isn't trying to deny it. They're just saying it and it gives them enough cover for them to be cheeky and tongue in cheek about it. Um, finally, we have of course, cyber war conducted by non-state actors. Uh, by various groups. And I think just if we've seen the proliferation of technologies like drones being used by sub-state actors, I think we're gonna to start to see the proliferation. In fact, we already started to see the proliferation of these techniques used by non-state actors. And that brings me to the second point uh, about cyber war is that we're, we've seen two trend lines. One, increased use of cyber war as an offensive tactic. Um, and then secondly, its use in combination with more traditional uses of coercion. And this is encapsulated in a newish term attributed to Russia called hybrid war, in which cyber war is part of a pattern of the use of state assets, including special forces, intelligence, economic coercion, diplomacy, and a variety of cyber uh, capacities to uh, prosecute a conflict in a way that will lead to a favorable outcome for the, for the using state. And so Russian operations against the Baltics, Georgia, um, Armenia, um, the Ukraine, both in Crimea and the Donbass region um, are all cited as examples. Uh, the Islamic State is cited as an example of the use of hybrid warfare by a non-state actor, combining a variety of kinetic, uh, diplomatic, and cyber means to advance its interests. So I think these are two trends we can identify. I, I agree with Richard. I don't think the prospects for a global treaty are in the cards, but I do think there might be some potential for a range of bilateral and regional cooperation with respect to both cyber responses, 
but also perhaps to an agreement that, you know, if you don't attack us, if you don't cyber attack us, we won't cyber attack you. So I do think there's some possibilities in that regard, but I agree that the prospects for a global treaty are pretty slim at this point. Thanks. Uh, over the last few minutes and in both your presentations, uh, China has come up. And I guess there are some people wondering about Canada's relationship with China. Uh, Ottawa does appear to be more or less paralyzed in terms of making any kind of policy, whether it's about computers and telecommunication systems or going to the Olympics or protesting minorities or whatever. Um, where, where does the Canadian Chinese relationship sit right now? And, and uh, what, what are the prospects for, uh, for the future, do you think? Well, I can, I can take a first stab. I don't know who wants um, to start with you? Okay, let Alan, please. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just take the first stab because uh, um, I, I spoke about China briefly, but uh, probably too briefly. But on the, on the um, it, it's, it's extremely difficult and challenging relationship right now, would be for any government. Um, I think on the one hand, our, last, our long standing desire to have a more robust trade relationship with China um, in light of the significance and, and still continued growth of the Chinese economy in the world. It's gonna be very important. Um, and that will be a, con a continued driver of Canadian policy. But our, our recent relationship has been hamstrung by first of all, the Trump administration, but also by a fairly lengthy campaign by China of, of espionage and pressure um, against um, Canada and Canadian citizens. And of course, uh, the holding of two citizens uh, in China over the Huawei uh, uh, Meng Wanzhou um, issue. So that has really put a severe constraint on Canada's um, relationship with China. And then we have the additional um, concern is as we are increasingly part of this tug of war between China and the United States for diplomatic influence around the world, there is a clause in the Canada-US-Mexico agreement that states that if any member of Kuzma wishes to open up a trade relationship with certain unnamed countries, that's not the exact language of the treaty, but it's pretty much what it says, uh, that, that it is subject to the review and approval by the other members of Kuzma, which in essence, let's say tomorrow, the Trudeau government wished to open um, a new trade treaty with China, uh, that would now be subject to review in Washington with the implication that Washington could exert pressure on Canada to not move in that direction. Um, and this is all just part of a much broader pattern of Canada and other countries, it must be said, we're not alone in this, being increasingly caught in an emerging cold war between China and the United States. And just as that constrained our relationship with the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact countries during the Cold War, if that continues to develop, it's going to constrain our ability and our freedom of action with respect to our relationship with China. Even after the Huawei business blows over, which I do believe it will, there are still going to be deep structural constraints on Canada's ability to forge a, a truly independent policy towards China. Uh, I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, the, the thoughts about I would add is that uh, it's in Canada's interest to, um, and, and this kind of relates to um, what can Canada do to organize more respect and clout uh, that one of the questioners, uh, Vijay Verma asked, uh, what kind of constructive role can Canada play? And, and um, I would like to think that it has a really strong interest in trying to kind of rebuild something of a coalition. Alan raised the, the analogy, the Cold War blocks that we had, you know, the East and the West. And, and uh, if Canada is to be successful against China, the last thing it should do is have bilateral, you know, negotiations, right? It's at a severe disadvantage uh, economically with the rise of China's economic power. And one of the legacies of Trump, I actually think whether this was uh, deliberate or not, one of the things that was smart about his trade policy was that he kind of 
take a wrecking ball to multilateralism and deal with everybody as much one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two -on -two in this case as you can, because that of course will give the US a preponderant advantage in virtually every scenario, right? So it's actually quite clever to just say, we're just gonna do individual <laughs> deals rather than allow you know, a bunch of countries to kind of gang up on us. And the same principle would apply to China that if you wanna offset China's economic might, uh, I mean, Australia is even more vulnerable than Canada right now with, Ch with Australia, uh, China engaging a variety of punitive measures against Australia. So, you know, the likes of New Zealand and Japan and Korea and Australia, Canada, if bound together with EU and the United States, that forms a massive kind of trading uh, block or at least economic weight of alliances that could be used when diplomatic instances like this arise to apply some pressure. Uh, whether that will come about, I don't know. But if I was, you know, in the, the Global Affairs Office, uh, that would surely seem to me to be something that's highly in Canada's interest to try and be a constructive contributor in bringing that kind of coalition together. Well, thank you very much, both of you. I think we've really come to the end of our time and Sandra's going to have a word or two to close this meeting. But on behalf of the over 70 people who've uh, tuned in and had a really uh, enlightening discussion. I wanna thank both of you for taking time out uh, during a busy week. And um, uh, I suspect we're gonna to wanna to have you back soon um, and uh, continue this conversation. So on behalf of all of us, thanks to both Richard and Alan for uh, a terrific afternoon. Very welcome, thank you.